Um, it was one of the highlights of my year meeting Amy last year. Angela was kind enough to point it out, and I'm sure these two will be no disappointment. And uh, no pressure. Um, and I'm also slightly relieved, just on the way in here on, in my taxi, uh, the taxi driver said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to an open data conference. And he started saying, I just really don't know what I think about that. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I just think it's just going on far too much with young people. And I thought, this isn't, this isn't what I think. <laughs> and I worked out, and was talk, I was talking about open dating. So we're not going to talk about open dating. We are going to talk about open data. Um, and I've got two fabulous people on the stage with me. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but uh, I have referred to myself before as somebody kindly shouted at me in the street that I was a dot-com dinosaur. So I am hoping that you guys will make me feel a bit less Jurassic and a lot more connected. Um, do you want to just quickly kick off telling us what's your name and where you come from? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm Ben Webb. Um, I've done a lot of stuff with... Um, particularly um, open data standards for international transparency. Um, so I did a bunch of work directly with the International Aid Transparency Initiative. And in April, I um, co-founded Open Data Services to do a lot of the same sort of work for with other data standards, such as the Open Contracting Data Standard and 360 Giving, the UK philanthropic data standard. <laughs> And a lot of the stuff I specifically do is kind of software development to build tools that um, help people with the data publishing process to these standards. Fabulous. Thank you. And George? Perfect. Um, my name is George Edwards. Um, I'm the founder of my startup GasSense. Um, it's a spin-out from my A-level coursework um, looking at the, the technology to monitor LPG, both in sort of small installations right up to big industrial things. Um, so obviously we're creating quite a lot of data and sort of Internet of Things space. Um, I'm, given my, my background and my age, quite interested in why uh, lots of young people don't, don't look at engineering and technology as a viable career. Um, so I do quite a lot of work around that. Um, and as lots of, of generational profilers will tell you, my lot are all quite interested in social change. So we sort of tried that as an a, a, um, angle. We went into a school a couple of weeks ago, um, and obviously the, the refugee crisis was... Um, right at the forefront of everybody's minds. So we took, I had already given a load of um, sensors to the, to the aid workers going out with gas bottles for sort of soup kitchens. Um, so we pulled all the data off those and overlaid that with a load of data from um, uh, publicly available data from where the refugee um, camps were and where the refugee, um, refugees were. So we could overlay our information of um, where the aid was with where the people were. Um, and in a morning with a, a load of students that had never looked at, at technology properly, we were able to create a heat map of where age should be targeted. Um, and something as sort of simple and, and fairly easy to do as that really struck a chord with them. Um, so that's my interest in open data and, and how it can, can uh, integrate with this new generation. Fabulous. Before we get into a bit more of the detail of what you two are both working on, I'm interested in your perspectives on your... I don't want to... Uh, be patronising, but the different age groups that you both come from. One of my challenges, as people in this audience may know, has been I feel like sometimes this community talks to itself quite a lot. And in this room, we're all very keen on passionate about this subject. And I'm interested whether you think that more broadly, in your peers or people that you know, the sense of open is as strong as that you would find in this room. Benjamin. Um, I, think, I think it's a difficult question for me because I always struggle to separate the the kind of change in the world at large in terms of uh, people's perspectives on this and the, the change in terms of the people I've ended up surrounding myself with. <laughs> Self-selecting group. Um, and, but it, I, th I, think, I think with open data particularly, um, it can be quite interesting to um, kind of watch kind of the edge of where people's awareness of that is because I, you know, quite familiar with the um, more general open source mm. community and I think whilst there's obviously a massive overlap, um, open data is not necessarily um, as well known as, as you, you might expect. Would you say your generation is more open than you perceive others to be? Generation. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the, yeah, I think so and I think um, I, th I, th I think there's a lot going on with private data at the moment and mm -hmm. how young people say, see that because I think there's um, the 
it's, it's, it's not even quite my generation, it's people a bit younger than me aren't using Facebook to mm. be sharing loads of stuff. They're using more private services mm. like Snapchat and so on. Um, but on, on the other hand, I think um, young people's expectations of um, services they interact with are, are quite different. And I think, um, I think their expectations of government services um, are that they, they should work um, much like the, the other stuff, you know, other services they interact with. Which is where I'm I think to bottle you and take you with me when I go around government because that is exactly the point that they think it, the expectation is now set so high. Is that those sentiments that you recognise? Yes, certainly. I think the the underlying kind of core belief is there, um, but I don't think people recognise it. Mm. I think there's a big issue. The press are far more interested in, in personal privacy and everyone's trying to steal your data and you've got to protect it. Again, with young people at schools, it's all about you know protect what you put on Facebook because mm. it's going to damage your career prospects and it's all terribly scary. Um, so whilst they have that, do you think that's right? No, it's a completely separate issue, and and in itself, the kind of backlash that that's causing is really threatening mm. a lot of this, mm. you know, really really powerful stuff that can be mm. done. Um, and I think that people, so people understand it. They just need it. It needs to be far. They don't. They, they need to be communicated that it is happening, and and what the whole sort of range of of work in in the sort of data space is, and it's not just about <coughs> your phones being hacked. No, I, I agree with you about the media perception. I think that. One of the things I've found uh, funny, I do a lot of work in digital skills and helping people get online for the first time. And I was sitting a while ago with a mother and a daughter, and she was the mother was probably about 55, 60, and she'd recently got on Facebook. And she was loving it. She was posting all kinds of pictures of herself. And her daughter, <laughs> who was about 18, was sitting there going, Mum, you are properly nuts to do that. You don't want all that stuff out there. And it was a completely different, it was kind of inverse, I think, to what people expect of uh, yeah. those two generations. But to tell us a bit more, you, you've both kind of done your own thing, and one of the things I found really interesting about, you can classify Generation Open as a younger generation, is that your perspective in terms of how you build your career and what you do is so different even to when I went into work 20 years ago, where you know, five years was my time frame, or maybe 10 even, whereas I think my perception is that you guys are building things in much smaller uh, project-based uh, ways. That, would you say that was true, and how does that feed into your projects now you're thinking about things? Um. <laughs> um, You've gone straight into entrepreneurialism, I mean, straight yes. from your, practically from your A-levels. Yeah, I think, I think with, again, it's a media thing, but also with, with the way that technology has affected my generation, which is a sort of generation that almost all of our education has been entirely supported by, by the internet and, and by sort of digital. Um, we're quite, people are quite aware and quite willing and, and encouraged to, to look beyond just mm. the sort of standard career path and, and, and you know, so, sort of look more widely afield. And I think projects, particularly from the sort of technical side, um, which is what I'm interested in, and again, many of the people that I, I spend time with are interested in that. Um, so sort of entrepreneurialism and, and, and uh, technology typically work well on, on project levels. Um, and it's far easier to go and specifically research something work on it and then communicate it. And that's, those are the sort of behaviours that technology drives. Um, so I think that that is something that particularly um, young people quite like working in that way and they respond well to it. So what kind of time frame do you two have in your, your work? Um, I, gu I, I guess, like you say, fair, relatively short time frames. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 guess it's, I guess it's tricky to, to unpick what of that's kind of my, my personal approach to thing and how, how how much of it is that we're um, kind of the open data space is kind of very very young and um, lots of very new um, projects that are you know currently working on fairly, fairly short timescales just because they're at, at that sort of very early stage. So if we stand two or three years out and look back at what you two have done over the next two or three years, what will you be shouting about? Do you think? That's, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> I think I, too many I, things. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, take a punt. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the, a big part of mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do at the moment uh, it, is um, working in this general effort towards um, data standardisation yeah. as part of open data. Because I think um, if if there's 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 one thing I 
think of when I hear Generation Open mm-hmm. is kind of having the um, assumption of open. You know, open mm-hmm. is kind of the air the that we default. the air that we breathe, and that but kind of open by itself is is mm-hmm. is not enough. And I think the um, I think points in the open data charter kind of really unders- underscore that. And a lot of the work I'm doing is is around standardization, but I think really the thing I'd like to look back on is um, seeing the work I'm doing being useful. Yes. So I think use of this data is, is, is really the end goal. And I think um, you know there's various routes towards helping that. I think standardization is one of them, but it's... So do you want to talk in a bit more detail about your project? Because we haven't heard it really described by you. Um, so um, at Open Data Services, we're working with a variety of data standards um, organisations. So one of them's um, the Open Contracting Partnerships that has the Open Contracting Data Standard. Another's 360 Giving, which has a philanthropic, um, is a UK philanthropic data standard. We do some work around the International Aid Transparency Initiative as well. And our, our, our approach to our work around that is um, trying to build um, tools that are useful across all these different projects and kind of help make um, publishing to these standards um, e- easier for people and also help make people make sense of the data that, that has been published. So you would really agree with Nigel's point that we've got to think about data as infrastructure and those Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very much so, and I think um, it, particularly <coughs> Um, with with the um, contra- contracting information, it's mm. kind of a that the, that project as a whole is is kind of at fairly early stages, but potentially you know that's that's going to be a massive piece of um, infrastructure information mm. about um, contracting processes. Mm. When George Osborne announced his infrastructure commission, that you may have heard about, which is a good attempt, I think, to have some longer-term planning in government, you would have seen a sort of barrage of tweets coming out from me that morning because there was no mention of digital as part of that infrastructure, let alone open data. And I you know, get frustrated, I think, when we still don't seem to embed, to your point, kind of the default should be both digital and open, I would argue. Do you perceive the, the same challenges in what you're doing around common standards? I think so, I th- yes. Um, it's interesting, I know, again, we've kind of touched on it today already, um, but the difference between, it's quite easy because a lot of what the government stuff, or what the government does because of this sort of funding model, it's quite easy to say that that should be open, here can we help you. Um, I, you know, my background is, is from the sort of commercial world, um, and, I, and again, they've got vast quantities of data that's, that's been specifically designed to be so valuable, um, and, and creating ways and, and helping the, the private sector um, Make that make that open and, and create value from it being open, um, and I think you know in sort of three, five, ten years time, however long it takes, mm. we need to get away from the sort of traditional sort of uh, mindset where you sort of create data, protect it, and defend it, and, and it's mm. our our value. Um, and I've finished working for BAE Systems, so you're obviously right down the the far end of the, yeah. the data spectrum, and everything's got to be as secret as you can possibly make it. Um, but they've got to understand that there's actually a huge amount of value for them, regardless of whether it's a <laughs> nice philanthropic thing and it helps other people but mm. just for them there's value in it being in them open sourcing some of their data mm. um, and letting other people see it so I I find it difficult where I'm standing from talking to young people and educational communities um, who are f- very receptive to it um, and then going in and um, pitching or being in a business conversation and, and you get that sort of blank look and oh that's a terrible idea um, why would you do that you know you've got to patent everything and um, and, and secure your value um, just because that's a much more obvious, yeah. um, sort of comfortable thing to Defensive do. Exactly. Position, yeah. um, so how do you overcome that? Well, what there are some what good are your tricks. Well, <laughs> well uh, examples help, and there are uh, very few, but some good examples of where a sort of modern mindset has worked. So Tesla is a good example, saying all of their IP is open because it will help people develop electric cars, and if they become accepted, then we will benefit. Um, Toyota saying we can do manufacturing better than everyone else but we'll tell them how we do it um, because then more people will develop and all the supply chain will will be far better at it. Um, 
So I'm those... on the board of Marks and Spencer. When I suggested we did that in a board meeting, you should have seen the faces. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure. <laughs> um, as opposed to if you'd suggested that we, you know, hire more security guards to stop that happening, that have, um, you know, that would have gone down far better. Um, so, so yeah. So that's that's interesting, and I think <laughs> that um, that there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, selling examples and and getting businesses to see that there is a huge tangible value um, and that, that companies don't die by, by not protecting themselves, they die by creating genuine value. Yeah. And I think um, there, is, there is a big cultural shift yeah. to try and have there, but I think you know, with, within government, we're, it, it, they're further along, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of this cultural shift towards, towards open, and yeah, I think we're at an early stage of that. Um, in business, and I think um, something that might help um, drive this forward is, you know, the cases where um, private companies are, are, are delivering stuff to government. You know, the, the governments need to um, start increasingly saying, well, you know, we're going to require you to yeah. um, produce this data, and we've we, we've seen um, I, I, the 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 big example I'm I'm kind of aware of is with the International Aid Transparency Initiative, yes. um, the Department for International Development in the UK um, has started um, requiring those it gives money to, both NGOs and private sector, to publish um, data about what, the, you know, what they're do, then doing with that aid money. I think you're absolutely right. So I'll ask you maybe a slightly trickier question. If you could do any kind of dream project for a company or an organization, where would you really love to get stuck in? It? Would it be BAE systems? Would it be a government department? What is it that you would love to be able to say, yes, we're going to create a completely different model of openness? Um, I think it's interesting. So again, I, I, as I say, I take interest in, in the way that young people view engineering. Yeah. Um, and I tried and, and, and the project failed for the roadblocks we've already discussed um, to get um, BA one of the companies, but a couple of the, these huge big engineering companies that have vast teams of people employed to collect data about their recruitment processes and the apprentices and, and graduates that they hire. Um, and, and they've got lots of data and it's in everyone's mutual interest that um, that information can be brought together to, to produce genuine insight about yeah. how they should target young people to, to be more effective in their their aims to make them look at technology, um, and they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't bring themselves to talk to people that aren't their competitors, they're just in the same space. Um, and I was really sort of taken aback and shocked by that. Mm. Um, so being in a, in a place where, where there are these sort of big programs that the companies are already working on, and, and getting them to realize across the organization that, that open data is a, a valid and, and likely the best tool for them to, to realize those aims. Um, so I don't know, I would necessarily be interested in any particular outcome, but the serious outcomes that, that businesses are already looking at and, and getting them to see it, yeah. much like with infrastructure, getting them to see it in, in the same box and not something that the you know, corporate social responsibility people yeah. deal with. Yeah. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I, well, I, I, I think I kind of identify some of this in, in the work I'm doing currently, because mm -hmm. I think with um, the open contracting data standard, there is there are a, a lot of large companies interested in that because there's a business position for them to be yeah. um, selling the procurement systems mm -hmm. people are using that then output this data. So I think that's, that's really um, kind of making the right incentives and driving this business case for producing open data is, you know, as a, as, as a feature of what they're selling to their customers is, is Quite important. It's interesting to me that you both pick, we've talked quite a lot about private company examples and in a way I find that kind of reassuring because I think it goes back to how does the sector build links outside just the sector itself and also again the data I read about uh, generations younger than me is that there is just an assumption that businesses should do the right thing and there's a kind of assumption that you need that social purpose which maybe sounds ridiculous to you guys but wasn't a given when I was starting in my working life 20 years ago, I think it was sort of the CSR box, as you say, over there, and that's moved very quickly. Do you think that's something you recognise? Yeah, certainly. And, and, um, and it's, it's a very, even in business, but kind of across the, the landscape, it's seen as a, a modern thing to do, which mm. is, is surprising. Um, but I 
through again through my work I've worked a lot with with Virgin and Branson and, and that's been something critical to what they've done um, yeah. you know right from um, when they started out um, you know let's look at a sort of modern open and, and positive way of doing things because it benefits everyone yeah. um, you know and again you can go back to sort of really cold hard economic maths and prove that that's a, a benefit to everyone um, yes Q and A don't worry Evan I'm on it <laughs> I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to throw it open to you now um, so some questions for these bright young people who are going to make our future better um, please anybody like to ask anything just wave a hand in the air there's a gentleman in the middle there great I think both of you are really very inspiring so that's first first comment um, but the big question I have is all related to your education and do you feel that you've had to sort of strive to show that you're interested in in the worlds that you're in or that you've been supported it through your school supported through it through your schooling because for me I wonder whether or not there's enough going on in schools to help you and people like you like my children or were you very well supported which is my hope Go for it. Okay. Um, I I was was very well supported at school. Um, I think I was was very lucky. I think it was quite unusual that the support that I had. So I went to the King's School Canterbury, um, and they had a big established engineering department, which I think is very unusual. So I was able to sit that as a as a course. So I had the support from a technological perspective. Um, I had some spectacular mentors from industry that came and worked with me on my projects. Um, and then when I um, said that, you know, the sort of suggestion was made that I, I started looking at it as a business. Um, the, the school were very supportive and, and made the first introductions for me to go down the patenting route. And there was a, a whole network that was, was made available to me. And I, I was very lucky to have that. Um, and to, I was very sort of strongly encouraged to look beyond the education on the university spheres um, and, and really take advantage of um, the, everything that was there, just, you know, despite my age. Um, I, I hear from a lot of the work that I do in schools, that isn't, that isn't the case for everyone. I think it should be, and that's critical to why I, I you know, try and do everything that I can to, to close that disparity. How about you? I, yeah, well, um, kind of the opposite. I think when, when, I, when, I, when I was at school, um, um, you know, the, the, there were no computer science courses. You know, there was, there was IT and um, A-level computing, um, which which was quite lacking. Um, I, you know, I, I, IT courses weren't taught, but were taught, weren't taught by IT teachers. They were taught by geography and other teachers. Um, so I think, um, kind of, over the past, um, well, um, I think, I think, up until recently, um, IT and um, particularly programming education in schools has been very lacking. And I think that is, that is slowly starting to change. I think there's, there's a lot of um, good work happening in that space to, to try and improve that. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's various groups like Code Club and um, Coded Dojo and, um, you know, something I've personally been involved in was, was Unity Wide State. Yeah. They're all right, I said they're all right. It's uh, interesting, isn't it, that at the same time as all this stuff becomes more important, arguably there's a bigger disparity between both of your experiences in education, and I agree that's a big concern. Anyone else? Gentleman at the front. Whip your hand up. Do you want to shout? Yeah. I'll repeat the question <laughs> if we can't hear. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, discussion. Um, I used to run an organisation called Engineers Without Borders. I'm now consulting with the World Bank. At Engineers Without Borders, we did a lot of work around Generation Open about trying to help people to understand when they need to apply linear thinking that we get taught in schools and when we need to apply network thinking, which is what we experience every day. Um, but when you're running an organization or running a startup or trying to set, set something new, you have to always interface between this rather harsh linear world where you have grant applications and deadlines and key performance indicators as a sort of a world of scientific management, project management, a very reductionist approach, um, and a world where it is about partnerships and coalitions and about empowering people, and it's, it's about um, creating change rather than, you know, creating impact rather than sort of indicators. 
Um, I found that particular experience of trying to interface between these two worlds exhausting. How have you found it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, and, and certainly quite marked with the, I, I haven't yet had my sort of transitional phase with the university, so I'm on my gap here now, so I've just finished school. Um, so it's kind of quite marked. Um, I think that the, generally the engineering mindset has helped, that's been my sort of underlying process and, and people, and, and mixing those two bits together sort of have got me through. Um, but I think it's, it's a, a big challenge, um, and, and particularly with my kind of lack of experience and sort of desire to be innovative, um, trying to apply that sort of networked, um, much more holistic, um, rounded approach to, to many of the linear um, processes causes, causes strife, but, but value if I can, can make it work. Um, so I think it's really interesting, and a lot of things are changing. Um, uh, grant applications, unfortunately, aren't one of them. <laughs> um, but, but yes. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is a, a, a challenge, and I think, um, pers personally, um, I, I've been working with others that I think have been taking on more of the brunt of, of, of kind of managing those those two worlds, um, and I it, it, I think it's definitely one of the things we're kind of grappling with as a new um, organisation at, at Open Data Services. So. Um, I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Us oldies find it hard to. Let's, we've got time for one more question, and I'm going to look around. There's a woman to ask a question. That's what we want. <laughs> Hello, Ruth McKernan, Innovate UK. So my organisation is there to build and grow new businesses. Most of those are product-type businesses, which might take 10 years to make a product and start getting revenue. So in digital businesses, that might be 10 minutes or 10 hours. <laughs> so how would my organization most help you? Sure, so, so I'm, I'm slightly different in that we are sort of hardware, so there's, we're kind of in the middle ground. Um, I think in terms of the, with the sort of faster pace or the sort of medium pace, um, there's a lot of additional support. So in a really long-term project, you know, for the first five or six years, it's mostly going to be money is going to be in the, the primary issue, and, and you're not particularly, you know, you don't have that many issues um, to face that like sort of marketing and PR and lots of the more holistic things that, that businesses struggle with. Um, with digital and, and sort of semi-digital, semi-hardware, where I'm at, um, there's a kind of interesting paradigm where engineers typically are, are the, the people involved because you're building products, but you very, very quickly got to get to grips with um, the sort of plethora of other issues that, that, that jump up, right, from sort of accounting to, to PR and, and marketing. Um, and I think that's, I mean, there's a huge amount of good work going on in the sort of startup space to, to aid that transition, but um, getting engineers sort of um, fit for business um, is, is, a, is, a, is a challenge, a big challenge, and one that I sort of struggled with. Um, so I think everything that can be done there um, from a mentoring perspective, from a, a tangible support perspective. Um, but I mean, even if you give someone loads of money that they can only spend on marketing, that still doesn't necessarily help um, because what you do with it and you can waste a lot of that money easily. How about you? This is a uh, dream question. I, help yeah. on the plate. What would you help on the plate. I think, I, th I, I think one of the interesting questions for us is pri primarily, you know, a lot of what Open Data Services delivers is services is in a sense kind of working out what our products mm -hmm. actually are because yes. I, that kind of um, that can be a useful way of thinking about things but it's not part of the challenge it is is work, working out what, what it is what is what is the core of of what you're delivering and you know what 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 do you want to be delivering and what's what what are the steps mm -hmm. to to get there well, that kind of ties back, doesn't it, to the same point about all those support bits and pieces. Mm. Well, as always, I feel like the future is in safe hands, uh, and I hope that it will be as open as you two are striving for it to be, and know that everyone in this room will be inspired by you and endeavour to help you. So thank you for joining me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you.